A male prostitute murdered outside his reservoir home this morning had been described in court as a self-proclaimed vampire and accused of ripping out the tongue of a woman. Even before he was brutally gunned down outside his Melbourne home, Shane Chartres Abbott knew his days were numbered. He said to me, I fear for my life. They called him the vampire gigolo. It was that gothic detail that really made this an unstoppable story. His murder triggered a $30 million police investigation. It was a revenge killing. But has justice been served? The person who uh, claims to have committed the murder didn't actually commit the murder. In fact, he wasn't there. Investigative crime reporter Adam Shand discovers an ugly truth. But what if everything the police had been told was a lie? The consequences are still playing out to this day. Truth always comes out eventually, doesn't it? You know, that's why I'm here. That's the only reason I'm here. This is the final resting place of Shane Chartres Abbott, the so-called vampire gigolo. Seven years ago, I began looking into his case, and to my surprise, I found a man that was denied justice not once, but twice. The investigation into his murder was a complete travesty, which exposed the rotten heart of justice in Victoria. Officially, the case is solved. There is a man in jail for Shane's murder. Unfortunately, in my opinion, it's the wrong man. In the period before he died, Shane Chartres Abbott was fighting to clear his name. He was a male prostitute, but he was accused of a bizarre and heinous attack on a client we will call Penny, as we can't name her for legal reasons. Now, she doesn't recall anything about the attack because she says she fell asleep and she woke up with these horrific injuries, and the injuries are horrific. She's got lacerations, she's got cuts, there's evidence of rape, and perhaps most intriguingly, you've got this very particular injury to her tongue, where, where part of her tongue looks like it's been missing. And there's other cuts and injuries that would be consistent with a particularly nasty sadomachistic assault. I'm in Melbourne, South Yarra, and the building behind me was the scene of the crime. In 2015, it was transformed into luxury apartments by the reality TV show, The Block. But in August 2002, it was a cheap hotel called the Seville. Penny was a tie-born stripper and prostitute, but she booked Shane to come and see her in room 307. It was the fourth time she'd booked him. Because Shane was the last person she recalled seeing that night, she assumed it must have been him who viciously assaulted her. And so police charged him. He just looked at me really, like, directly, you know, the most direct gaze I think I've ever encountered, and just said, I didn't do it. He said, please give me a chance. Just, he said, you'll, you'll come to know me and you'll believe it. Uh, you know, believe what I'm saying. What did he say happened that night at the Hotel Seville? He said he went up to the room and he knocked on the door. Um, he described an Asian man opening the door and he was a, quite aggressive in his tone. Penny then appeared and he said Penny was not her usual self. She seemed um, tense and just not as um, fluid in her conversation as she might have you know, otherwise been and, you know, some considerable time into uh, his stay there. She then divulged to him uh, that he was in danger, that he was being 
um, set up for a snuff movie. What's a snuff film? A snuff movie is someone who is killed or dies, you know, in the course of the act of sex. Yeah. According to Penny, human traffickers in the sex trade had brought her to Australia. She owed a debt. To settle it, she had to recruit a young man like Shane, and he was about to be killed in room 307. I think he said he left around four in the morning. And um, really, that's as much as he said to me about what happened at the Seville. Shane's version of events at the Hotel Seville that night was very different to the victim's recollections. She sensationally told police that Shane had claimed to be a 200-year-old vampire that needed blood to survive. The media quickly dubbed him the Vampire Gigolo. It was that sort of gothic detail added to the gruesome nature of the crime that really made this a, um, an unstoppable story. Did you ever mention the vampire thing? No, never. He was uh, very enthusiastic. He was very charismatic. Sonny Naidu met Chartres Abbott when they worked together in sales for a telco. They became friends and Shane shared details of his life. Shane's girlfriend was expecting his second child and he was working as a male escort after hours. But that did not define him. He was a deep thinker as well. You know, we had some really good conversations, intellectual conversations, deep conversations, where he would talk about his views on, on, on life and, the, and his views on the world. But he was always about uh, enjoying himself and bringing people in and, and making people feel, feel good. He enjoyed a drink, he enjoyed a dance, you know, we, it, was, it was fun. A normal guy. He was really, really normal, yeah. Chartres Abbott had no history of violence, but as a prostitute, he did have a professional specialty. Bondage, discipline and sadomasochism, or BDSM. It involves role play and there can be pain. But what happened to Penny was off the charts. Look, in my experience as a you know, professional health educator, I had lots of contact with uh, many people who worked particularly in the BDSM area. I visited a lot of the places they worked at and I've never encountered anything, you know, that would come anywhere near that level of, um, you know, horror, really. He told you that as far as he was concerned, mm. he'd just done what he was paid for mm -hmm. and then left the scene and she was perfectly fine. She was perfectly fine, yeah. So he must have been completely mystified that he was now being charged with this, this heinous assault and mutilation. Well, he was. I mean, he was mortified, you know, as you can imagine. Um, he, was, he was scared. He was very, very scared. He was wondering, he didn't know what was going to happen. Um, he was also starting to get really paranoid as well. Shane wrote some personal notes while he was preparing for his trial, and I've got them. In them, he writes, I'm the fall guy for someone else. I have no motive, except they're only able to say, B and D, bondage and discipline, gone wrong. Someone else was in that room. Someone else raped Penny and beat her and left her for dead. As Shane tried to understand the situation he was in, he began to feel a conspiracy was afoot. We're talking about people in very high places. We're talking about judges, we're talking about police, we're talking about politicians. That had some involvement mm that also included the production of snuff films. Yes. He would often say to me, Sandra, this is, you know, bigger than Texas. We're not talking about a deck of cards, we're talking about 12 decks of cards. I remember one of the last times I saw him, he was whispering, and we were in a place that was, there was no one around, and he was whispering to me, and he said that he believes he's being followed, and um, he said two people are following him. And I said, hey, well, how do you know? And he said, well, I've noticed them at my house and I've noticed them in the city. Did he say his life was in danger? He believed so, yeah. Despite his fears, Chartres Abbott was determined to give evidence at his trial. 
He was very keen to exonerate himself. And the day before he died, we were leaving the court. Shane was just in front of me and the police were behind me. And he said, you wait till tomorrow when I get up in, in the box. He said, all the jigsaw pieces will come together. And I know that one of the police heard that. It was very audible. And, you know, I was talking to Shane and he said, Sandra, I'm being eyeballed. And there was a small cluster of police just across on the pavement. And I looked and it was, they were eyeballing him. And he said to me at that point, um, I fear for my life. And I said to him, no one's ever been killed in the midst of a county court trial. You know, you'll be fine. And he was killed the next morning. Next. Shane Charters Abbott had been standing out the front of his reservoir home when he was ambushed. But why is a prime suspect left alone? He doesn't have to answer one question. A male prostitute murdered outside his reservoir home this morning had been described in court as a self-proclaimed vampire and accused of ripping out the tongue of a woman. Shane Charters Abbott had been standing out the front of his reservoir home with his girlfriend when he was ambushed. The house in Reservoir where Shane lived with his girlfriend Kathleen has been demolished. But you would have thought when Victoria Police began a murder investigation, they'd start with a motive. Who'd want to kill a sex worker who was about to spill the beans on a massive sex conspiracy? But what about a straight revenge murder plot? Someone close to Penny, the woman who was attacked by Shane apparently the previous year. Well, it turns out that Penny did have another man in her life, her ex-boyfriend, Mark Adrian Perry. Mark Perry was a figure that was really on the periphery of the, of the gangland scene in Melbourne. He started out, he was a, a nightclub bouncer in Brunswick Street, Fitzroy. Uh, from there, he started dealing drugs. It might have just been marijuana to start with, but then he moved into what really was a blossoming trade in cocaine and ecstasy and speed. As he was you know, working his way up in that scene, he met Penny, who was then an exotic dancer at one of the early um, strip clubs that had popped up in Melbourne when all the liquor laws were deregulated and they started this uh, sort of unlikely relationship. Within days of Chartres Abbott's murder, police were getting calls from members of the public naming Mark Perry as a suspect. So they had people calling up Crime Stoppers and saying, you need to look at this guy. This is the ex-boyfriend of, um, of the woman who was, who was raped by the guy who got killed. Is There's an obvious motive there. They created this photo identikit of a, of a Mark Andrews, which is an alias that he went by, and put that out. But then they never did what seemed like the obvious thing to do, which is actually just bring him in and question him. For reasons that they've never properly explained, the police sort of just stood off this guy. So throughout this whole period, he doesn't have to answer one question to explain his whereabouts, what he was doing that night, or whether he knew anything about the killing. Three years on, Victoria Police had made no arrests for Chartres Abbott's murder and the investigation had gone cold. They were busy with more pressing matters. A man whose body was found in a Brunswick street on Saturday night may be the 25th person to die in Melbourne's gangland war. Vic Pohl's elite Piranha Task Force was mopping up the blood of a gangland war over drugs, which had Melbourne captivated for eight years. Um, you know, we will bring this to an end. We will find the people responsible and we will prosecute them. So you either finish up dead or in jail. It's not a good option either way. From 2004, a wall of silence began to crumble and hitmen were lining up to inform on their former bosses. Deals were on the table for the right stories, even if those stories did not lead to convictions. One career criminal, who I can't name for legal reasons, so I'll call him the author, took advantage of this while he was incarcerated. This evolved from a police interview on an unrelated matter in 2005. Speaking from behind bars, the author opened his hand and displayed the word vampire. 
Police knew he was referring to the Chartres Abbott murder, but the author wasn't ready to go any further. A year later, the author decided to give more detail. He requested to be interviewed sitting with his back to the camera. Strangely, the police allowed this, even though the camera would not capture his body language. As the tape rolled on this bizarre interview, the author confessed to murdering Chartres Abbott. I am unable to remember exactly the date and the year as I've been in custody now for over two years on other matters. I wish to make it clear that this incident was not a contract killing. It was an incident that transpired as a result of the deceased's assault on a number of females. Came to my knowledge that the deceased, in his role as a male escort, had brutally inflicted injuries on more than one female victim. So it was for personal reasons, a result of a favour for a favour. I decided to help eliminate a person whom I regard as an animal and a danger to other females. It was a revenge killing. As far as the police were concerned, the author's confession was an incredible breakthrough, and it came without any prompting. All they had to do was believe it, and the author gave them every reason to. He told them he put a couple of bullets into Chartres Abbott as a favour for a mate, Warren Shea. And Shea was doing a favour for Penny's ex, who the police knew to be Mark Perry. The victim's ex-partner was closely associated with Warren, and it was the wishes of the ex-partner to have Chartres Abbott dealt with as a reprisal for the attack. My understanding of what Warren was asking to be done, in not so many words, was breaking every bone in his body, right through to killing him. I told Warren to leave it up to me and the matter would be dealt with. I recall saying, he is an animal and a piece of shit and deserves to go. Consider it a favour. The author named a third man as his accomplice, boxer Evangelos Gooses, who was already doing life in jail for two other gangland hits. Then the author rattled off a list of building blocks to complete his story. Before the murder, he claimed to have watched Chartres Abbott's house from the car park of the railway station nearby. He told police where they could find the murder weapon in Geelong and a gun was found in the exact location. He also said Gooses had been shadowing Chartres Abbott at the courthouse in the days before he died. The threads of his story seemed to be coming together. But what if everything the police had been told was a lie? Why would the author make such a detailed confession if he couldn't back up everything he was saying? His allegations led to the most expensive investigation in Victoria's history. The bill came to more than $30 million. I've been going over that investigation in some detail. And I can tell you from the beginning, there was something very wrong. Coming up... I fired two shots from a .357 revolver. The author's version of how he shot Chartres Abbott versus the forensic evidence. There's a huge difference between shooting a gun like that and like that. In 2006, the author, who we can't name for legal reasons, confessed from behind bars that he'd killed Shane Chartres Abbott. Over the next six years, he changed or edited his evidence six times. There were many meetings with investigators and more than a 1,000 phone calls. It took an extraordinary amount of massaging to get the author's version of the murder to stand up. This should have been a warning signal for the police, but apparently it was not. The police even kindly supplied the author with a street directory to help him recall the street where he'd killed Shane. But that just produced more problems. I have looked in the Melways today and I'm able to recall and describe the street where the deceased lived, which is Howard Street Reservoir. I've also been able to recall the getaway route as described yesterday. The author said he observed Shane's house from this train station car park before the murder. That sounds OK when you look at the area on a street directory, but in reality, the house is behind this workshop on the corner. You simply can't see the house. But there was also another problem with his recollection of the murder. I fired two shots from a .357 revolver, and I made sure both hit the mark. With the first shot, I was aiming for his chest, and the second, I presume, it was around the head-neck area. 
It's hard to say, as his defensive reaction of being confronted by a firearm made his movements a little bit erratic. By well, that I mean he was kind of ducking. So the author's version, Shane Chartres Abbott, is ducking, indicating the bullet probably would have gone in through the, the well, it, it's actually hard to work out how you get the kind of wound that Shane Chartres Abbott has and is established by forensics. The Victorian coroner found the bullet that pierced Chartres Abbott's neck was fired from very close range and the bullet travelled upwards through his throat and into the top of his skull. In my book, that's a major inconsistency. There's a huge difference between shooting a gun like that and like that. But what of the revolver itself? The police escorted the author to Eastern Beach in Geelong, where he said he disposed of the weapon. And police found it exactly where he'd nominated. But there was a problem. He said they would find two spent cartridges in there, plus four live rounds. The gun was empty. So the problem with that was that although they'd found the gun, they still didn't have a uh, physical evidence linking the author to the crime. So his story was still in doubt? Well, there were certainly holes in it. And more holes would appear in the assassin's story. The author claimed Gusis, his accomplice, had gone to the county court to eyeball Chartres Abbott during his trial. He claimed they saw each other outside the courtroom. But what did the evidence say? When they looked at the CCTV footage, they did find an image of someone that perhaps uh, could be Ange Gooses, but really, you couldn't be sure. Once again, something that the author had promised didn't quite stack up. An element of doubt should have been creeping into the investigation by now. But senior police had a powerful reason to go along with the author. In his second statement of 2006, he revealed new allegations. He threw serving police officers and past officers into the frame for the murder of Shane. It's fair to say that afternoon was the beginning of the end for your police career. Well, as it turned out, yes, that's true. Peter Lawler worked for Victoria Police for 28 years. On June 4, 2003, he was working at Paran Police Station. At 4 p.m., seven hours after Chartres Abbott was murdered, the author walked in the door. My memory of that day is that uh, he couldn't make the, the time that was agreed to. He was running late, so uh, we organised, rescheduled uh, for later that afternoon. He turned up, I executed the warrant and uh, uh, set a court date, and he left the, uh, the police station. Three years on, the same person uh, made a statement saying that um, the execution of the warrant was part of a, uh, a plan to provide an alibi for the execution of uh, a guy called Chartres Abbott, who was better known as the, the Vampire. Had you ever heard of that name before? No, no. Um, so I don't get uh, how that can be an alibi, because uh, uh, the murder occurred uh, at about nine o'clock in the morning, and he fronts up at the police station at four o'clock in the afternoon. The author's allegation was obviously doubtful, as was his claim that he'd paid a cash bribe of $1,500 to Peter Lawler at the station, potentially in view of other police officers. Regardless, Lawler was hauled before the Office of Police Integrity in relation to the alibi and bribery claims, and one other shocking claim that would destroy his career. What was the detail of that allegation? Well, the detail was that I had supplied uh, the address to uh, the person who claims to have killed uh, Shane Charters Abbott. Yesterday, a senior Victorian officer, Detective Sergeant Peter Lawler, was suspended from the police force. He's being investigated for allegedly giving a hitman the address of his target, a male prostitute gunned down in June 2003. After the break, more carnage as the author continues to take aim. He's in the game and he's running the show. Never made sense at the time and it makes less sense now. Shane Chartres Abbott was murdered outside his house in 2003. In 2007, following an unexpected confession by the man we're calling the author, Victoria Police formed Task Force Briars to investigate police links to the crime. 
This is where this all gets pretty messy. The author, expanding on his first confession, made some more startling revelations. He claimed that he'd met four serving or past members of Victoria Police at a pub in Melbourne before the murder. In fact, there were several meetings. On hand at these meetings were Peter Lawler and his mate Dave Waters, who was then a former detective sergeant. He also threw in Inspector Bob Hodgkin and Detective Constable Ben Archbold. I can't name the pub, but I can tell you Task Force Briars accused all four men of being on the scene at that pub when Peter Lawler allegedly gave the address for Shane Chartres Abbott to the author, thereby setting in train a murder. What role did they say you had in that conversation? I was, I was present and a party to the conversation. Can you think of anything more ludicrous than a whole bunch of coppers sitting around with a well-known informer and crim discussing a contract that he was about to take. It just doesn't make sense. It never made sense at the time and it makes less sense now. When Ben Archbold was accused of being party to the conversation, he retrieved his diary and checked the date. I had to think from, for a moment and then I was able to realise that I had a watertight alibi. And what was that? I was on Big Brother. I had audio, I had CCTV and I had 24 hour surveillance of me and it was great to be able to get him off my premises. And I scored him out and said goodbye. And I haven't seen him since. As for Robert Hodgkin, the author didn't know his name, only that there was an older man at the pub, an inspector of police. It seems your only qualification for involvement in this was the fact that you were friends with David Waters and Peter Law. That's right. Yeah. How would you describe the damage to your career from that period? I went from in 2007, I was the inspector in charge of the Melbourne West Police Station and the Carlton Police Station. I had a staff of over 300 people working under me. Uh, I come back from leave and I'm sitting in the corner of um, Corporate Management and Review Division. Probably the worst job in the police force. What's your attitude to the job after, after well, the way I you were walked, treated? Well, I walked out the door and never looked back. Yeah, I was happy to be out of it. Following the author's claims, Lawler and Waters read in the Age newspaper that they were also going to be charged with conspiracy to murder, but they were never charged or even arrested. You've got to wonder why the author would go to such trouble to cook up the pub story and why would the Briars task force believe him? So Melbourne at that time was in the middle of one of the, the bloodiest periods in the state's history. Melbourne's gangland wars seem to have taken an intriguing twist with the murder of an alleged drug dealer who is due to give evidence against corrupt police. You've got criminals dying at an alarming rate. And one of the storylines that kept coming up, was that there was a connection between police and what was happening in terms of the murder. So this view that police were actually involved in some of the killing that was going on. Victoria needs an independent, broad-based anti-corruption commission. And we call on the Victorian government to establish such a commission. When the author wrote Vampire on his hand in the bold letters, they thought that this was their moment where rather than being subject to a royal commission, they would be able to prove for themselves a link and get rid of uh, whatever vestiges of, of uh, corruption there were within their ranks. About six months ago, detectives from the Piranha Task Force received information suggesting there may be a link between police corruption and the, the organised crime murders. As soon as we received that information, we set up two task forces to investigate the allegations. Operation Briars was one of the task forces established by the Deputy Commissioner of Police, Simon Overland. It is very, very difficult to stop this sort of crime from occurring. Um, it's planned in secret. It's uh, executed in secret and ultimately um, you know, we will bring this to an end. We will find the people responsible and we will prosecute them. In some ways it's a career opportunity. He's been touted as the next uh, chief commissioner. And he uses a phrase which has now become legendary to describe what this evidence means to him. What does he say? Yes, he calls it the showstopper. So the author realises he's got a lot of power, a lot of levers over the police. Well, he knows this is what they want, this is what they prize pretty much more than anything. He knows that it'll put him in the driving seat of what comes next in terms of uh, negotiating with police, whether it's uh, perks for himself, 
in jails, whether it's being able to sort of manipulate situations where he's able to settle old scores out of jail. Basically, he's in the game and he's running the show. What's the outcome to him? So he's already serving a lengthy sentence uh, for other crimes uh, when this happens. But if you like, this is one he gets to do for free. He pleads guilty out of the blue to a murder, yet as a consequence, he doesn't have to spend a single additional day in jail. By 2007, the police renewed their interest in Mark Perry. He was the ex-boyfriend of Penny, the woman Chartres Abbott allegedly assaulted and raped in 2003. This gave Perry a strong motive to exact revenge. In fact, the author told police that he'd murdered Shane for a mate of a mate, Perry's ex, though he didn't know him as Perry. Four years later, the police still hadn't brought Perry in for questioning, but they did have him under surveillance, which at times was nothing short of farcical. There was one desperate attempt to, to bug him in a cafe on the Gold Coast when he meets Warren Shea. Could you describe what happened there? The uh, police have set up a, a bit of a surveillance sting and they've got these uh, microphones embedded in the salt and pepper shakers. But it doesn't work out. The bugs don't um, transmit what they're saying. So then you have this slapstick moment where Steve Abrahart, who's a, um, a senior investigator working on the, um, the Briars Task Force, he positions himself so sort of surreptitiously on the next booth and he's kind of leaning back and trying to listen to these guys as they're having their conversation. The problem is you've got music going and the clatter of plates and knives and forks and everything else. So in the end, they just get a few um, sort of snippets of, um, of the conversation that don't really help them in their investigation. This was the last chance they had with Mark Perry for years. It was. They lost sight of him pretty soon after he left the cafe um, for I think it was about six years uh, where he was on the run and became Australia's most wanted man. This is Mark Perry, the man Victoria Police so badly want that they're offering a million dollars to get him. Police surveillance video shows him at an airport in 2005 and at a Melbourne service station in 2007. But soon after investigators shot these images, Perry somehow became aware he was being tracked and he disappeared. They thought he'd gone over to Thailand. They thought given his connections over here, that would be the obvious place to hide. So a lot of the expense that they clocked up was they had people on full-time surveillance in Thailand, keeping an eye out for Mark Perry. But of course, he was nowhere near there. In fact, Perry had moved to Perth, where he was hiding in plain sight. He lived this very kind of frugal life where he rode a bike around Perth. He worked menial jobs. Uh, for cash, he paid rent in cash, um, he didn't have a mobile phone, he didn't use a credit card. So it's so, so really like something out of a, um, a John Grisham novel where he just kind of, you know, lived entirely uh, off the grid and, and avoided um, anyone noticing him for uh, many years. Perry's life on the run finally came to an end in 2013 when he bumped into an old friend from Melbourne who perhaps, with the million dollar reward in mind, lured him into a photo booth. The photo found its way to police and soon after, Perry was caught in Perth. Victoria Police has already successfully applied for Mark Adrian Perry to be extradited to face charges over the 2003 murder and is expected to face the Melbourne Magistrates Court on Friday. After the break, Mark Perry's sensational confession. He tells her that he's the one that killed Shane Chartres Abbott. But will Perry's confession change the direction of the police investigation? In 2013, after six years on the run, Mark Perry was captured and charged as an accomplice in the murder of Shane Chartres Abbott. But what if he actually pulled the trigger and not the author? While he was on the run, Perry's ex-girlfriend Penny made an explosive statement to police. She'd never shared what she knew about the murder or the extent of their relationship. She told police that years after the murder, she'd met Perry in a Melbourne pub and he'd made quite a detailed confession. They're sitting together in a pub. They haven't seen each other for a long time. And after a couple of drinks, he leans over uh, close to her and, and tells her that, that, that he's the one that, um, 
that killed Shane Chartres Abbott. And as he does it, he, he makes the, his um, hand into the, into the shape of a gun. He puts an arm around her and he shows her how he killed him at point blank range with the pistol right up underneath his chin. Perry's description of how he killed Chartres Abbott fits the forensic evidence the police already had. In contrast, the author told police he fired from a couple of feet away, which suggested the bullet had travelled horizontally. If you had the two accounts and you're trying to match one up to the forensic evidence, uh, the story that, that uh, Mark Perry told fits a lot uh, easier than the story that the author told. This should have changed the whole direction of the investigation. It was clear evidence that discredited the author's confession. It could have been used to build a case of murder against Mark Perry as the shooter, but that would have meant discarding the allegations of police involvement in the murder. And faced with that deflating prospect, investigators decided to stick with the author's version. The main reason is, of course, that it doesn't fit with their case. They're, they're years into this prosecution, which is, which is very much about Mark Perry arranging for other people to do the shooting. If Mark Perry does the shooting himself, the conspiracy falls away and so does the involvement of the police. So they need that original story to stack up. And they may well be right. You know, Mark Perry has um, certainly never uh, admitted to me that he, he killed Shane Charge Sabbath. You've asked him? I did ask him, yes. And, he, and he's, he's maintained that no, he had nothing to do with it. Other than Penny's word, there was no evidence to suggest that Mark Perry killed Shane Chartres Abbott. However, in 2014, 11 years after Chartres Abbott was gunned down, Perry, Gooses and Shay went on trial for the murder. Waters and Lawler were suspects, but they were never charged. The star witness for the prosecution was the author, the man who'd already been convicted for the killing. But on the day he was due to give evidence from jail via video link, he refused to come out of his cell. So there's this uh, crisis then. The senior detective on the case is sent to the location where the author's being kept, and he has to basically convince this guy uh, to turn up and, and give this evidence that he's been uh, promising for the last six years. When the author finally gave evidence, he faced a searing 10-day examination by the barristers for all three of the accused. During the trial, the defence uh, team found 23 uh, instances of evidence which was exculpatory. That is, that um, he would say something, they would go and investigate it uh, and interview people and find that uh, that didn't occur at all. In the end, the Crown case collapsed under the weight of its own contradictions. The author was asked to reaffirm what he told the police in his statements, that he'd killed Shane Chartres Abbott as a favour to Warren Shea, who was a mate of Penny's ex. Back in 2006, the author seemed in no doubt about what Warren Shea had wanted him to do. My understanding of what Warren was asking to be done, in not so many words, was breaking every bone in his body, right through to killing him. I told Warren to leave it up to me and the matter would be dealt with. I recall saying, he is an animal and a piece of shit and deserves to go. Consider it a favour. So having said that Warren Shea wanted Chartres Abbott killed, the author recants on that crucial piece of evidence and says that to the best of his recollection, uh, Warren Shea only wanted him hurt. The judge says, now what do you mean by that when you say you want him hurt? And he said, well, is there anything from uh, a beating to breaking every bone in his body, but not killing him. So the whole murder conspiracy vanishes at that point. It was only a matter of time before the jury handed down its verdict. Not guilty. Walking free, Warren Shea and Mark Perry leave the courtroom and life in custody behind them. Co-accused Evangelos Gusis was also acquitted. There were handshakes between the three men in the dock, cheers and applause as the jury read out its verdicts one by one. All three of the accused were also cleared of manslaughter. At the end of the day, the investigation is a search for the truth. And that's all we asked for, uh, natural justice and procedural fairness and a search for the truth. Um, and it seems to me that uh, they lost focus at that. And uh, the truth always comes out eventually, doesn't it? Next, 
is the wrong man in jail for the murder of Shane Chartres Abbott. You know, that's why I'm here. That's the only reason I'm here. Eleven years after Shane Chartres Abbott was gunned down in the front yard of his home, three of the men accused of his murder were found not guilty. I'm sure Mr Perry appreciates his freedom. Thanks very much. The case raised more questions than it answered. The author had claimed to have killed Shane Chartres Abbott, but the police spent years trying to stand up his evidence and failed. It might have all been different had they believed Penny's evidence and returned to the man who had the motive. Instead, they allowed the author to railroad a murder investigation. Well, let's state for the record that uh, the person who uh, claims to have committed the murder didn't actually commit the murder. In fact, he wasn't there. Uh, when you're training, uh, going through detective training school, one of the things they teach you is that uh, the physical evidence never lies. Mr Chartres Abbott was shot under the chin at very, very close range because of the... Um, the gunshot residue and the tattooing, where well, that's not what um, the author said he did, how he did it. I fired two shots and I made sure both hit the mark. With the first shot, I was aiming for his chest and the second, I presume, it was around the head and neck area. His description of how it uh, occurred was at odds with the, uh, the forensic evidence. Now, if they had have conducted the inquiry along the lines of the established principles of investigation, they would have knocked this out within a month. But as it turned out, uh, it took many years, a lot of money, $30 million, we think, um, and for what purpose? If you can imagine the author, the, the day that he wrote The Vampire on his hand and he, and he started this, this whole thing, it was just like this kind of brick being dropped into the pond. The concentric circles sort of went out and they just enveloped all these people over the years and there was a huge human toll well beyond the murder of, um, of Shane Chartres Abbott. This is a story that's deeply affected so many lives. Nearly two decades on from Shane's murder, the pieces are still being picked up. Let's take a look at the main players and see where they ended up. The author went straight back to jail after the trial to serve out his other life sentence. He has informed the state that he will not seek parole and intends to die in prison. Evangelos Gusis also went back to jail, where he is serving two life sentences. Warren Shea returned home to his family after serving a two-year sentence for refusing to answer questions at the Australian Crime Commission. Mark Perry is declined to tell his side of the story. Penny is married with two children and is living in Melbourne. Simon Overland achieved his ambition of becoming Victoria Police Chief Commissioner, but was later forced to resign. Detective Ben Archbold left Victoria Police and retrained as a lawyer. Detective Inspector Robert Hodgkin got his retirement badge from Victoria Police, but he never received an apology for being dragged into the web woven by the author. That leaves the accused police, David Waters and Peter Lawler. We're not suggesting that any police were involved in the murder, but in the eyes of the law, they're still persons of interest in the murder of Shane Chartres Abbott. To this day, I'm uh, a persona non grata as far as uh, Victoria Police goes. If uh, any member wants to associate with me, they've got to uh, fill out what's called a, a declarable declaration and present it to his superior officer. How does it sit with you? Like, I mean, you've got a lot of friends in the force. How does it sit? Well, look, I know I haven't done it. Uh, at the end of the day, it, uh, what matters is uh, what my friends and family think. Uh, as for the rest, I don't really give a damn. Do you miss him? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Of course I do. He was a great guy. He was a fun, caring guy. You know, and if there's an opportunity to rewrite the story a little bit or to give a new perspective on things, then uh, I'm happy to do it, you know, because I think it's, um, it's only just that people don't think of him in that way. You know, that's why I'm here.
That's the only reason I'm here. Shane Chartres Abbott and his family have never received the justice they deserved. He died before the end of his trial, and the investigation into his murder was completely unsatisfactory and will remain so until the author finally comes clean and confesses that his confession was just one big lie from beginning to end. Perhaps then, Shane Chartres Abbott, the supposed vampire gigolo, can finally rest in peace.